Well, first God said, I'm going to rent it out of your hand and I'm going to give it to your servant. Verse 11. Now in verse 12, he says, I'm going to rent it out of your hand and I'm going to give it to your son. Well, is God going to give the kingdom to Solomon's servant or to Solomon's son? He's going to give it to both. Welcome, everybody, to the conversation today. My name is Daryl Arnaz. I am with Freedom Creation Ministries, located in the city of Largo, Florida. And I am so glad you've taken out the time to join with me this evening as we look at another conversation around the Word of God. Well, before we go any further, let's just have a word of prayer and thank the Lord for his presence, that he is with us because he is the promise keeper, <laughs> miracle worker. That is who he is. And I, I want to just say to you before we begin, what if you have a pressing need in your life, if you have a pressing need, challenge in your life tonight. As we go into prayer, I want you to just lay that at the feet of the master. I want you to take your burden to the Lord in prayer. He is ever present and he is ever ready to meet every need of his beloved. Amen. Let's pray. Father, creator, master, we thank you so much for the redemption that you've given us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your word. Your word that tells the story. Your word that reveals to us your plan, your word that reveals to us your purpose. We thank you for the presence of the Spirit who leads us and who guides us into all truth. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy who inspired the writing of the scriptures. And we thank you that he is present to open the eyes of our understanding, that we can understand what has been written. We thank you for glorifying Jesus through the death and burial and resurrection, ascension and glorification. We thank you. We thank you that you are present to meet every need of each person that is listening to this conversation. We thank you for healed marriages. We thank you for doors of opportunity for employment. We thank you for healing spirit, soul, and body. We thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. We thank you that we have a great high priest we thank you that he ever lives to make intercession for us according to the divine will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. I am always amazed at how God works in our lives. I am always amazed at how he prepares us to be witnesses in the earth. I am always amazed at how he gives us line upon line and precept 
upon precept, understanding of his divine will and purpose. I am day by day learning that the scriptures for me need to be a way of life. The scriptures for me needs to become my culture. The scriptures for me needs to become my living bread. The scriptures for me need to be more than a set of truths, more than a body of information that can form right doctrine, as important as right doctrine is, that the scriptures need to become more to me than just something that I use to prove a point or to be able to justify things that I say. The scriptures need to become daily the bread that sustains me in my journey with Christ, in my ministry in the world, and in my relationship with my creator. And I trust that is what you are daily learning anew as we follow in the footsteps of the master. I want to begin this conversation by giving you two quotes that I came across in my studies as I'm preparing the series of talks. And the first one is by a fourth century BC philosopher by the name of Aristotle. And Aristotle made the statement that the least initial deviation from the truth is multiplied later a thousandfold. The least deviation from the truth is multiplied later a thousandfold. It's like measuring a piece of wood. And we cut that first piece of wood and then we take the second piece of wood and then we cut the third piece. And then we take the third piece and we cut the fourth on and on and on. There is the possibility that by the time we've cut the last piece of wood, it is larger than or thinner than the initial piece of wood that we cut because we were a little bit off on the first cut. And then we use that piece of wood that was the first cut and we use it for the third cut. And again, it, it, it becomes a little more off. The, 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 the least deviation from the truth, the least initial deviation from the truth is multiplied a thousand fold. I want you to think about that as we consider the word of the Lord. The second quote is by a theologian by the name of Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas says, and I quote, little errors in the beginning lead to serious consequences in the end. Little errors <laughs> in the beginning lead to serious consequences in the end. Applying 
those thoughts to Christianity explains why the church today and the faith that is preached today as Christianity is so different than the church that we read about in the scriptures. The message that we preach is so different than the message proclaimed by the early church. And we ask, why is that the case? Little errors in the beginning lead to serious consequences in the end. The least initial deviation from the truth is multiplied later a thousand fold. The purpose of the Reformation that most of us are products of, those of us who belong to Protestant denominations, the purpose of the Reformation was to begin to restore the faith back to its original form. They were aiming at restoring the purity of the faith. They were aiming at renewing the covenant community, the church, back to the foundational principles of the faith recorded for us in the scriptures. That was the purpose. Not everything that needed to be restored has been restored through the reformation of the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. There is an ongoing work of reformation and an ongoing work of restoration that's taking place in the body of Christ. Now, the tragedy that happens with a lot of modern thinkers, and I talked about this a little bit in my last conversation, is rather than when errors are discovered, rather than tracing the error back and getting back to the initial cut, we continue to use cuts, <laughs> teachings, trying to adjust, and in many cases, justify the error so that the end result is more error and has been multiplied a thousandfold. This is what eventually ends up being termed apostasy. I want to talk about a couple of these errors in our conversations, and I want you to understand that it's not my intent to bash the church. I'm not sent to bash the church. I'm sent to build up the body. I am sent to speak to my brothers and sisters about the faith of Jesus to spur them on to good works, to challenge my brothers and sisters to examine their beliefs to make sure that they're in the faith. I'm not sent to enter into doctrinal debates to prove a point. I'm not sent to do any of that. None of us are 
if you want to know the truth about it. We are sent to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we go through this conversation tonight, please keep that in mind. I'm not here to bash the church, but we do need to point out some errors that crept in very early that have had tremendous impact on how we understand the gospel today. In John chapter 4, it's where we're going to start, and then we'll work backwards. In John chapter 4, we have this story. You'll be quite familiar with it. It says this. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. He left Judea and he departed again into Galilee. Verse 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. He is leaving Judea and he is on his way back to his hometown in Galilee. And it says he needed to go through Samaria. If you've ever looked at a map of that region, what you will discover, there are many routes between Judea and Galilee, which enable the traveler to bypass Samaria or other neighboring cities that they don't wish to go through. But the scripture said he must needs go through Samaria. Now, remember, we know clearly from the New Testament story that the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. Though they were related, they did not get along. So, but Jesus needed to go through Samaria. And we're going to look at why Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Because Jesus is in the process of adjusting the understanding of the Samaritans of the message and their expectation that they had relative to the Messiah. Why? Because of little errors, because of small deviations from the truth in the beginning. And we're going to look at what happened. And verse 5 says, he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, I would imagine that the Holy Spirit could have just inspired John to say he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, and left it there. But the Holy Spirit wanted it pointed out that it was near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. So we are introduced in this story from the beginning to three points. Number one, we're talking about Samaria. Number two, the area where he went was near a parcel of ground that the patriarch Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Both Jacob and Joseph are very prominent figures in the history of the people of God. I would imagine that John would expect 
the readers of this text to either understand the significance of Jacob and Joseph, or they would go back to read about Jacob and Joseph to discover why this parcel of ground is talked about. We're talking about an inheritance. Stay with me. We're talking about an inheritance. And this inheritance is in a place named Samaria, which for the Jews of Jesus' day, the Samaritans were a taboo people. But Jesus needed to go through Samaria. What's interesting about the entire ministry of Jesus, Jesus seems to do things, go places, and say things that brush up against the culture of his day. Jesus seems to go places, do things, and say things that brush up against the culture of his day. Not just the societal culture, but the religious culture as well. And I submit that this is always the case when you're dealing with reformation and you're dealing with restoration, it's going to cause you to go places, do things, and say things that brush up against the current culture, both politically, societal, and religiously. So anyone who thought that following Jesus was a magic carpet ride to heaven needs to go back and reread their Bible. Jesus said, if they receive me, they'll receive you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. So what is the issue with Samaria? First Kings Chapter 16. Then we're going to go back another step. But in 1 Kings chapter 16, we read this. So Omri, this is one of the kings, slept <laughs> with his father and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri, or Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel. Israel in Samaria 22 years. Interesting. We have Asa, the king of Judah, and we have Ahab, the son of Israel. Ahab is reigning over Judah in Jerusalem. Ahab is ruling over Israel in Samaria. So we are up against a question. Are Judah and Israel the same people in the biblical story? Is the house of Judah and the house of of Israel, the same people. Judah had its kings. It had its prophets. It had its priests. It had its place of worship. It had its practice of worship. 
But so did Israel. Israel had its kings. Israel had its prophets. Israel had its priests, its place of worship, and its practices of worship. But they're different. So what we discover is there were two houses of Israel proper. There is the corporate Israel, which was all 12 tribes, but then there are the houses which were divided. We're going to look at this in a minute, which consisted of two tribes in Judah, 10 tribes in Israel. All of Judah were Israelites, but not all Israelites were of Judah. This is a very important point. It's a very critical point. And this is one of those points where this little error in the beginning has had monumental consequences on how we read the scriptures. This single point, all of Judah were Israelites, but not all Israelites were of Judah. There were two houses of Israel. So backing up just a little bit, it says this, verse 23, in the 30 and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel 12 years. Six years he reigned in Terzah, and he, Omri, bought the hill Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill Samaria. But there's a problem. Because verse 25 says, Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did worse than all that were before him. This is Omri, the king of Israel. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did worse than all that were ever before him. Omri, it could be said, was the most apostate king that Israel had up until his son Ahab. And we all know what happened with Ahab. But Omri did evil. Verse 26, he walked in all of the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Keep vanities in your mind. We're going to come back to that. Omri walked in the sin and in the way of Jeroboam in which Jeroboam made Israel to sin. So now we're introduced to another individual still connected to Samaria. Now, all of this is important because if we don't understand this background, when we read Jesus needed to go through Samaria and we see Jesus's interaction with the woman, and when we see the woman recognizing Jesus as a prophet, and when the woman understands that this may be Messiah, you will understand what was going on with Samaria, why Jesus needed to go through Samaria. The issue was bringing the Samaritans back to the covenant. This is a part of reformation. Y'all stay with me. <laughs> so let's take a look at 
how this whole thing got set up. Scripture says in 1 Kings chapter 11, King Solomon, you know, this is King Solomon. This is the king that built the temple, Solomon's temple. This is the king that built the first temple, not the second one. This is the king that built the first temple. This is the king who brought glory to the kingdom of Israel. This is the king that God gave wisdom and God gave understanding and God gave favor. This is that King Solomon of whom tradition says, and scripture even says at one point, that Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. We're talking about that Solomon. But King Solomon loved many strange women. <laughs> Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel. Now, at this time, Israel is one house. They're one nation. They're one kingdom. And God told them, when you go into the land, do not follow after the ways of the nations round about you. Do not marry these strange women. Now, if you didn't hear the teaching that I did on Mystery Babylon and her daughters and how Mystery Babylon was referred to as a harlot and this harlot uh, enabled to, this harlot was enabled to corrupt the world so that the kings of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth became drunk with the wine of her fornication, but she had daughters as well. What we're reading about with Solomon connects to this. We're going to see how in a minute. So he loves all these strange women of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, don't go into them, uh, neither shall they come into you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. When you start getting in bed with strange women, they're going to turn your hearts away and you're going to start serving their gods. Now, to connect this, please go back and listen to the, to the conversation I did on Mystery Babylon, because I want you to understand that not only is uh, God discouraging them from engaging in fornication in the natural with strange women, but for the new covenant community is a admonition for us not to commit fornication with strange women, i.e. the daughters of Babylon. Why? Because they're going to cause you to begin to worship their gods. Harlot churches. So he says, they're going to turn your heart away after their gods. But Solomon clave unto these in love. Verse 4. It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. So Solomon departs from the ways of the father. <laughs> Y'all stay with me here. Solomon departs away from the ways of his father. 
I'll ask you, have we departed away from the ways of the fathers of our faith? By the fathers, I am referring to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I am also referring to the fathers of the new covenant faith, which are the apostles. See, many people have turned from the fathers, the apostles, and they have gone after the fathers of Constantinian Christianity, which presents strange women and strange forms of worship. We're going to see this in a minute. Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David, his father. So what does Solomon do? Verse 7. Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. Let me read verse 8 again. Likewise did he for all, underline that word all, <laughs> all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. Verse 3 says, he had 700 wives. Solomon had 700 wives, and he built high places for all his strange wives. This is the introduction of idolatry into the nation of Israel. This is that little error that crept in that had tremendous consequences. This is that slight deviation from the truth that had monumental effects and multiplied a thousandfold when it was all said and done. Little deviations from truth, beloved have tremendous consequences. We may think, well, it's just, you know, a little thing. It's, it's nothing big. You know, the way we say it today is this. Well, it's not a salvation issue. <laughs> you know, it's not a salvation issue. No, but it could lead to other things on down the road. So we have to make sure our lives are being measured by the word of God, not the tradition of men, the word of God. And as I say, oftentimes, the word of God is not rocket science. You don't need a degree in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin to understand your scriptures. What you need is a relationship with the God of heaven who inspired the writing of the scriptures via the Holy Spirit, who also comes and gives us an understanding of what the scripture is actually talking about. But as I said earlier, it will cause you to go places, do things, and say things that brush up against the current culture societally and religiously. And that's uncomfortable for a lot of people, especially when it comes to things dealing with the faith of the scriptures. Everybody believes this. Well, because everybody believes it doesn't necessarily mean it's so. Uh, because somewhere in the history of the church, you know, they declared that it's heresy doesn't necessarily mean it's heresy. They accuse Jesus of heresy. They accuse Peter of heresy. They accuse Paul of heresy. Who? The tradition of the elders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I submit we have a whole school today of Pharisees and Sadducees, the modern day Sanhedrin, who are accusing people of being heretics because they don't subscribe to certain beliefs and practices that they've inherited from Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, the apostate church, especially in America. So 
Verse 9, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him. Now watch this. Twice, Solomon had two visitations from God. This is King Solomon. He had two personal visitations from God. We got people today who claim to get five visitations from God in an hour. You know, God you know, revealed this to me and God showed up to me and God spoke this and God appeared to me and God said this, that, and the other thing. King Solomon had two visitations of God. Isn't that something? Moses had maybe two visitations of God. Paul had one direct visitation of God on the road to Damascus. But we've got people today, God visits them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All right. Now I'm, t- I'm talking about personal visible appearances here. God is with us because Jesus is in us because of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not talking about those types of visitations. I'm talking about people who are claiming to have the supernatural appearances of Jesus. Solomon had two. It said the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and commanded him about this thing, that not to go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Folks, listen, we cannot be followers of Jesus and not do what he commands us to do and then call it grace. That's not grace. Grace is is the ability that God gives us to obey what he commands. Grace is not something God gives us so we can disobey. Grace is something God gives us, a work of God, a force of God, the activity of God in the human heart that enables us to obey. Grace, favor, mercy, But Solomon, (laughs) he didn't keep what the Lord told him to do. So the Lord said to Solomon, you know, for as much as you have done this and you have not kept my covenant, covenant (laughs) is crucial with God. God is the God of covenant. He said, I am the Lord that confirms the word of my servants and confirms my covenant. God is a covenant keeping God. But there are people today, and I'm going to show you where this comes from. There are people today who try to teach covenant isn't important. The new covenant doesn't apply to the new covenant community. That doesn't even make sense. The new covenant has to do with the Jews, with Israel, of whom they're speaking and calling the Jews Israel. We've already pointed out that all Jews are of Israel, but all Israelites are not Jews. But all of Israel is called to be a covenant-keeping community. But we have churches today say, oh, that's not necessary. And I'm going to show you why they get, I'm going to show you why they say it. I'm going to show you where it comes from. He said, wherefore the Lord said, because you didn't keep my covenant, my statute, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to your servant. (laughs) That's what I'm going to do. Solomon, you reigned at the behest of your father, David. When your father, David, rested, you became heir of the kingdom. You became heir. But what I'm going to do, now watch this, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to your servant. Now watch, now watch this now. 
verse 12, notwithstanding, in your day, I'm not going to do it for David, your father's sake. Now, David was dead. Understand the nature of God. Understand the grace of God. Understand the covenantal faithfulness of God that we're reading here. God is saying, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, but I'm not going to do it in your day for David, your father's sake. See, David was faithful. And I promised David that his son would reign upon the throne. I promised David certain things. Now, just because you got out of pocket and you got jacked up, that does not mean that I'm not going to fulfill my promise and my covenant to David. See, I keep covenant for generations for those that fear me and walk upright, but I won't clear the guilty, but I keep covenant. There are those of us today who are being blessed because of covenants that God made with our forefathers. And this traces all the way back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. See, God's purpose is so far beyond our ability to logically reason it out. This is, this is where theology falls short. And I think I've mentioned, I love theology. I'm a seminary grad. I, I, I read and study theology to this day. But this is where theology falls short because the only way you can really understand fully in an ongoing process, because we're never going to understand everything there is to know about God, that's virtually impossible. And we'll have eternity to be ever learning. But <laughs> to begin to understand something about the nature of God, about the work of God, uh, about the purpose of God, uh, about the people of God, about the covenant of God, about the word of God. This is born out of relationship with God. See, this is where we have to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and then follow Jesus. So Jesus invites us into that fellowship of his sufferings. What fellowship of his sufferings? Where, where we come to the point where we can say like Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ lives in me. Folk, listen, it's not a doctrine. I don't know why people keep arguing doctrine so much. It's not a doctrine. It is a reality. It is a lived experience. This is the word becoming our daily bread. This is us being sustained by the word of God. This is not an exercise in how smart we can get. That's not, that's not, that, that's not it. But God says to David or, or to Solomon, I'm not going to do this in your day because of David. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to give it, I'm going to rent it out of your hand and I'm going to give it to your son. Well, first God said, I'm going to rent it out of your hand and I'm going to give it to your servant. Verse 11. Now in verse 12, he says, I'm going to rend it out of your hand and I'm going to give it to your son. Well, is God going to give the kingdom to Solomon's servant or to Solomon's son? He's going to give it to both. Now watch. This is where the two houses of Israel come in. And I don't know why, I, really, I don't know why a lot of modern day presentations of Christianity and modern day scholarship and modern day, as much revelation as people claim they're having downloaded. I don't understand why these aspects of the scriptures, which are crucial for us to understand the rest of the scripture is never really talked about. It's never really dealt with. It's just glossed over. And this is why we keep saying that the Jews are Israel. The Jews are not Israel. 
Jews are from the house of Judah. There is a house of Israel as well. All Jews are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Jews. Let's keep going. So, he says here in verse 13, Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but I'll give one tribe to your son, for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. I am going to give one tribe. And then there was a tribe that joined up with the tribe of Judah. And that became the house of Judah. That is who, when you're reading in the Old Covenant, if you read the Old Covenant, this is where you start reading about the house of David, right? And you read about the house of David and you read about the house of Joseph, two separate houses, houses as in dynasties, houses as in uh, nations, houses as in people groups, this is the house of David. This is the house of Judah. This is the nation of Judah. But over here is the house of Joseph. And there's a reason it's called the house of Joseph. See, you remember Samaria? Jacob gave a plot of land to his son, Joseph. See, something happened with Joseph. <laughs> Something happened with Joseph that set the stage for the prophetic flow of God down through historical time. It's through this that happened with Joseph that the promise that God made to Abraham, where he said, in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. He didn't say all nations. He said all families of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because the redemptive plan and purpose of God is to touch all of the human family. It's mystery Babylon that wants to keep nations fighting against one another. It's God's design to bless all of the families of the earth through the seed of Abraham. That's another conversation that I did a little while ago that you owe it to yourself to go back and listen to. It's called the thread of scripture and it's all about the seed. All right, let's keep going. It says this. Let's jump over now to chapter or let's stay in, in, in chapter 11. Let's read verses 41 through 43. It says this, the rest of the acts of Solomon, he's summing up, and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? That's the Chronicles, books of Chronicles. And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. Interesting number, 40 years. Sound prophetic? <laughs> 40 years, the spies spied out the land, but they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, or they, they spied out the land for 40 days, but they wandered in the wilderness for... 40 years. Jesus was tempted by the enemy in the wilderness for 40 days. Solomon reigned over the house of Israel 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and he was buried in the city of David, his father. Watch. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Remember, God said, I'm going to rend the kingdom. I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to your son. But he also said, I'm going to give it to your servant. Now we're getting ready to see how this happened and what the result was. Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Chapter 12, verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were to come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when 
Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it. Why was Jeroboam in Egypt? Because he fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. It's amazing. We keep hearing about folk coming up out of Egypt. We know Israel or the Hebrews went into Egypt and they were brought out of Egypt. Here we have Jeroboam had fled into Egypt. Moses went into Egypt. Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt when they came after Messiah Jesus. They took them down into Egypt. And so the scripture can say, out of Egypt have I called my son. This is all prophecy. This is, this is all, <laughs> glory to God, I'm having fun with this. This is all in the, the, the plan and purpose of God to deposit within his word, the word. So he says here, now watch this. <laughs> called him out of Egypt that they sent and they called him and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and he spoke unto Rehoboam saying your father made our yoke grievous now therefore make the grievous service of your father and his heavy yoke that he put on us lighter and we will serve you. So Jeroboam comes and he says to Rehoboam, he said, listen, your father, you know, he, 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 was, he, he was a tough boss. You know, it was tough serving your dad. So listen, if you will make our yoke lighter, we will serve you. But watch. So Rehoboam said, tell you what, depart for three days and then come up, come back, and so the people departed. Now watch what Rehoboam does. Here is another little error that happens in the body of Christ today. And I'm seeing this more now than ever. And I've been around for a minute. This isn't my first rodeo. I've been around for a minute, but watch what happens. King Rehoboam consulted with the old men, the elders, that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, what kind of advice do you give me? How should I answer these people? So Rehoboam went to those who stood before Solomon. He went to those who had some wisdom. He went to those who had been around for a minute. He, he, he went to those known to be able to provide sound counsel, sound instruction. These are not novices. And this is part of the problem. And, you know, Paul refers to this. And, and Paul said, you know, don't put a novice in a position of authority. And, and this is a lot of what's happening um, in the body of Christ today. See, everything that's written in these scriptures are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world would come so that we would know how we ought to order and govern our lives. But he goes to the old men. How should I answer? So they told him, if you will be a servant to these people and you'll serve them and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. So if you want to build a loyal people that you're going to govern, you need to serve them. See, ministry is about serving people. Ministry is not about being served. Let me say that again. Ministry, true ministry, is about serving people, not having people serve you. 
And so much of our ministry today is about ministry wanting to be served by the people. So carry my briefcase, get me some water. And we call this submission and accountability. <laughs> That's what we call it. Because we like to take those little deviations from truth and rationalize them and try to justify them. And then we build doctrines to support it. And then before you know it, we got a mess on our hands. And this is why we have so much church abuse. This is why we have so many people being hurt by the ministry. Because ministry is trying to lord over people, not serve people. This is the advice that the old men gave to Rehoboam. But watch this. Verse 8. He forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him. But watch what he did. He consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. So we're going to reject the wisdom of the elders. We're going to reject that because they're out of touch. God's doing a new thing. So these folk who've been around for a minute, uh, you know, they are washed up and God's moving them, you know, off the scene so he can raise up this new breed of the Joshua generation and God's raising up kings and God is doing this. Folk, listen, I heard that stuff 25 years ago. <laughs> I was preaching messages on the Joshua generation 25 years ago. It's not a new revelation. This stuff just keeps going around in circles. You know why? Because we're not consulting the wisdom of the elders. We're not listening to those who have walked this thing out all their life and can help us to avoid some pitfalls. So we make the same dumb mistakes that they did instead of listening to their wisdom to avoid the pitfall. Why? Because we're getting counsel from people who came up with us. We just got saved. Tech and prophet and apostle on our name. And then all of our little friends <laughs> do the same thing and think that they're making headway in the kingdom of God. And they're really not. They're just creating a mass of confusion. And a lot of people are being hurt spiritually by a lot of this. But as I stated, we are in a time of reformation and restoration. God is putting a check on all of this stuff.